Welcome, today is Friday, October 16th, 2020, and this is a NERI webinar intended to disseminate educational information and research outcomes around natural hazards and the built environment. Today's webinar is hosted by the Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructures Computational Modeling and Simulation Center. This webinar is supported by the National Science Foundation under awards 1612843 and 1520817. Any statements in this webinar are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. For more information about NERI and the Sim Center, visit designsafe-ci.org, where you can find links to the Sim Center and the NERI Learning Center and the facilities supported by the National Science Foundation. Today, we're joined by Mariam Asgari Munegi. Dr. Munegi. Dr. Asgari Munegi has a broad and multidisciplinary background with more than 10 years of experience in structural engineering for civil and mechanical engineering applications. She has experience in experimental and computational wind engineering, performance-based seismic analysis and design of buildings and bridges, and computational solid me mechanics. She is an expert in nonlinear finite element analysis for a wide range of applications. She is currently a structural engineer with AECOM, working on all aspects of analysis and design of transportation structures, mainly bridges located in, located in high seismic zones. Before joining AECOM, she was a structural an analyst with the Advanced Technology and Research Team at Arup. She was involved in multiple high-end projects on the performance-based seismic analysis and retrofit of structures, as well as computational simulation of wind loads on the built environment. She is a part-time lecturer with the Civil Engineering Department at the California State University of Sacramento, where she teaches structural engineering courses. Dr. Asgari Munegi, welcome. Her, the title of her presentation is Partial Partial Turbulence Simulation for Predicting Peak Wind Loads on Buildings. So welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Matt, for the introduction. The topic of today's webinar is Partial Turbulence Simulation for Predicting Peak, Lo peak Wind Loads on Buildings. And I would like to thank my team members, Dr. Peter Irwin and Dr. Arinam Chaudhary from Florida International University and Dr. Mohammad Moravich from Wal uh, Walker Consultants. This is the outline of today's presentation. I will briefly go over an introduction first. Then we have a section on wind tunnel testing and I talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we have when performing large scale wind tunnel testing. Then I will present the methodology of partial turbulence simulation, which is basically an analytical methodology for overcoming some of the challenges that we have for large scale wind tunnel testing. Then we will go over some of the experiments that we performed in Wall of Wind at FIU in order to validate this methodology and finally some conclusions. Wind loads are one of the most critical design parameters for coastal construction and this is especially uh, true for, for Florida where we have the highest levels of wind in the nation. Hurricane winds can exceed uh, can cause economic losses which can exceed $30 billion each year in the United States and unfortunately loss of many lives. Over 70% of the buildings in the United States are low-rise buildings like single-family residences or small commercial structures and these structures account for the majority of losses due to hurricane winds. Among all building components, roofing elements are the most damage prone ones if a roofing element is dislodged from the roof, it might become windborne debris impacting other structures downwind. And in case that the building envelope is breached, an internal pressure is generated inside the building, which can separate the roof from the rest of the structure. And then we would have dramatic increased losses because of water infiltration and induced interior damage. Wind tunnel testing is generally a very useful tool for evaluating wind loads on structures. When you do a wind tunnel testing, you build a scale model of, uh, of your structure and put it inside the wind tunnel, as you can see in this picture that I have. 
And then you should simulate the wind velocity profile and turbulence characteristics of the atmospheric, net, uh, atmospheric boundary layer. On the picture on the left hand side, you, uh, I am showing the wind speed profile and turbulence intensity profile in atmospheric boundary layer. You can see that the wind speed start at zero near the ground and it increases as we, as we go higher in the atmospheric boundary layer until we reach to a height that is called a gradient height at which the effect of friction from Earth is basically vanished. And above that, we have wind, um, uh, wind speed, uh, which is constant. The turbulence intensity profile follows a reverse path. We have the highest levels of turbulence intensity near the ground where we have all the obstructions and uh, trees and buildings that, uh, that create this turbulence for us. But as we go higher in the atmospheric boundary layer, the turbulence intensity increases. Another important characteristic for turbulence, which is important for us to simulate in a wind tunnel, is called turbulence integral length scale. I will go over it a little bit more in detail in the following slide, but you can think of it as a representative size of the turbulent eddies that we have in the wind. In a wind tunnel, we design these tires and flow roughness elements such that we could simulate the atmospheric, net, uh, atmospheric boundary layer, including, including a wind velocity profile and turbulence, in, uh, turbulence characteristics that represent well the corresponding values at full scale. Let's talk a little bit about wind turbulence. Wind is the movement of air masses over the Earth's surface. It consists of turbulent eddies with varying sizes. If we take a look at this, this picture that I have on the left-hand side, we have, on, in the wind, we have all of these turbulent eddies with different, uh, different sizes from, from large eddies to small eddies. The turbulence, uh, that these turbulent eddies basically cause fluctuations in your wind velocity. If you take a look at this um, picture on the right-hand side, I am showing a time history of the wind velocity. And you can see that the time, uh, the wind velocity is not just a constant value. The time history varies. We have these low frequency fluctuations in the wind velocity uh, time history. And we also have some high frequency fluctuations. The low frequency fluctuations are caused by these larger eddies in the atmospheric boundary layer. And these are what we call large scale turbulence. The high frequency turbulence, like these ones that you see here, these are called by the smaller eddies or what we call small scale turbulence. Buildings are bluff structures. They are not streamlined objects. The picture on the left hand side shows a case when the wind approaches normal to one of the walls. In this case, Above the stagnation point, the flow separates from the edge of the roof. It creates a shear layer at the edge of the separation point. If there is enough space on the roof, the, the, the separated flow might reattach again and create a separation bubble. For the cases that wind is blowing at a, at a skewed angle or at a cornering angle, we have the formation of conical vortices. The aerodynamic behavior of a structure like a building is generally governed by these two fellow phenomena, the, uh, the separation and also the formation of vort uh, conical vortices. And these two phenomena ge are generally governed by, the, um, governed by the oncoming flow turbulence. We have the small scale turbulence that can alter the path and strength of shear layer and vortices and the strength and path of shear layer and vortices directly affect the wind load that you see on, on your structure. So it's very important to simulate the small scale turbulence inside your wind tunnel when, do, when you do a wind tunnel testing. The effect of large scale turbulence is more like the changes in wind speed and wind direction. It can also change the strength of shear layer and vortices and has an, has an effect on the wind load that you get on your, on your structure. Let's go over some of the scaling issues that we have uh, when we do wind tunnel testing. When we do wind tunnel testing, as I explained, we have a scaled model of the building and we need to simulate the wind velocity profile and all the turbulence characteristics. Take a look at the, the picture that I have on the left hand side. I am showing the wind velocity profile the height of this profile for wind engineering application is about 275 to 500 meters. 
when we do every internal testing, we need to scale down the, this atmospheric boundary layer with all of these turbulent eddies with the same scaling that we are scaling down our building. If we assume that the test section of a typical wind tunnel is about two meter, which is the case for most of the wind tunnels that we have, the model scales that you can, that you can basically have for a full uh, turbulence simulation inside your wind tunnel comes out to be in the range of one to 200 or one to 500. This is something that we call small scale testing. At these scales, it, these scales are okay for performing tests on uh, lar larger structures, like for example, super tall buildings. But at this case, if you take a look at this low-rise building that I have, my model becomes very, very small. For low-rise structures, we prefer to perform large-scale testing, and there are a number of reasons for it. And one of the most important ones is we can have a more accurate geometric modeling, and we can better replicate the effect of architectural features in, in, in our structure. The next uh, reason for large-scale testing is that we, can, we have enough room to put enough number of pressure paths so that we could get an adequate spatial resolution of the pressure distribution around our structure. And finally, we can keep the Reynolds number high enough to avoid any adverse scale effect. But the problem is when you do large scale testing and you have this larger model inside your wind tunnel, you are not able to simulate the full atmospheric boundary layer inside your wind tunnel anymore and you are only able to simulate the lower heights of the boundary layer. This is basically and simply because of the limited size of the wind tunnels. So these large eddies that you see on your wind that create the low frequency turbulence for you simply do not fit inside the wind tunnel. What is the result of this? The need for large, uh, large scale testing impedes full turbulence simulation. In this slide, I have a comparison between the, the turbulence spectrum between full, uh, full scale or what, what I call full spectrum and I'm showing with this uh, solid black line with, this, with the spectrum from wind tunnels at, perform at three different model scales. You can see for smaller scale model, which is a, which is a model scale of one to 400 shown by green line, I can simulate a, a, a turbulence spectrum that matches at high frequencies as well as low frequencies and matches uh, pretty well what we expect at full scale. But as I increase my model scale to 100 and then to one to, one to 100 and then one to 50, I am still able to simulate the high frequency part of the spectrum, but I am losing a lot of energy at the low frequency. The effect of this is that when you compare the estimated, when you compare the peak pressures that you get from a wind tunnel testing with the ones that you expect from full scale, you could get as much as 50% differences, especially for the cornering winds. Take a look at this uh, diagram that I have on the right hand side, which is um, data from uh, Texas Tech University building. It is a comparison between wind tunnel data and full scale data. And you can see that, especially for cornering winds, there, uh, there is about 50% differences between what I, what I get from wind tunnel what, and what I have at full scale. There are a number of reasons for this, but the, uh, one of the main reasons is not having enough low frequency turbulence when, when you do large scale testing. And the other reason is that when you do small scale testing, your Reynolds number is as low, it's much lower than the full scale, and then you are going to get some adverse scale effect. On the, re on the issue of Reynolds number, uh, we can take a look at this, uh, this comparison between wind tunnels and full scale as well. These, this, this diagram is showing the peak pressure and the, the, the peak pressure coefficient from, uh, from wind tunnels and the one that we have at full scale for one pressure tap located on the roof of a queue. For small scale testing, you can see the value of pressure coefficients that I am getting from wind tunnel testing is almost half the one that I, that I, that I actually have in full scale. 
but as I increase Reynolds number, meaning I do larger scale testing, I get closer and closer and closer to the full scale. The, the ones, uh, the pre-pressure coefficients that we get from um, wall of wind, which is a wind, large scale wind tunnel facility at Florida International University should be around this range. And we are going to come up with some methodology that we can actually use wall of wind and get full scale equivalent data. Talking a little bit about Wall of Wind. Wall of Wind is a NERI experimental facility for wind engineering research. It is the largest and most powerful university research facility of its kind. It is capable of sim simulating category five hurricanes. You can see a picture of Wall of Wind and in this slide on the left hand side, you can see the 12 very large fans by which we, we create the wind speed at Wall of Wind. The picture on the right hand side shows the test section of wall of wind. It's 20 feet by 14 feet. And these pyres and flow, these pyres and flow roughness elements are uh, the things that by which we simulate the atmospheric boundary layer inside wall of wind. Well, the question that we have is we have this great facility, but how can we obtain reliable data from large scale testing? And by reliable, I mean full scale equivalent data. So we came up with this methodology. It's an analytical methodology. It is called partial turbulence simulation, which basically says when you are doing large scale testing, it is okay that you only simulate the high frequency part of the turbulence spectrum, as long as you compensate for the lack of low frequency turbulence using some analytical methodology and the post test analysis. Partial turbulence, this is a flow chart that shows different steps of partial turbulence simulation methodology that we are going to go over. It is basically uh, divided into two different sections. In partial turbulence simulation, we divide, if you take a look at this picture on the, uh, on the right hand side, which shows this, the wind turbulence uh, in uh, a comparison between full scale and partial turbulence simulation, what we do in this methodology, we divide the spectrum into two distinct statistical processes, one at high frequencies, which is simulated in wind tunnel, and one at low frequencies, which is uh, treated in a quasi-steady manner in post-test analysis. We are going to go over these two parts in the rest of the presentation. The first part uh, relates to the wind tunnel simulation. We need to, what we are going to do in a partial turbulence simulation is to make sure that we are satisfied and we are basically simulating the high frequency part at the right energy level when compared to full spectrum. In order to do that, we need to address three questions, uh, which is related to wind simulation in a test at, with a partial turbulence simulation. The first one is, what should be the desired turbulence intensity on my model such that I can have a pretty good match between my spectrum and full spectrum at high frequencies? The next question is, what is the intensity of the missing low frequency turbulence in my partial turbulence simulated flow? And then the last one is, what is the dividing frequency between low and high frequency? You are always saying we can match the high frequencies, we are missing low frequencies, but what do we mean by that? This is a uh, mathematical method methodology and an analytical methodology, and we have uh, equations to address each and each of these questions then that I just presented, and I'm going to go over them briefly in the rest of the presentation. The next part of the turbulence, partial turbulence simulation methodology is to post-processing the data to compensate for the lack of low frequency. There are a number of versions for PTS methodology. I am going to concentrate on, um, on the simplest one and the most complex one in this presentation. The simplest one, which we simply call PTS, it is simplified in a way that we only correct for the lack of low frequency longitudinal turbulence. But we have a more complex one. It is called 3D PTS or 3D three-dimensional partial turbulence simulation in which we correct for the lack of low frequency, longitudinal, lateral, and vertical turbulence. 
And the rest of the presentation, when we, I am going to go over some of the mathematical equations that we developed, we hear the turbulence intensity and integral length scale a lot. So turbulence intensity is basically a measure of the magnitude of the fluctuating velocity component compared to a mean wind speed. And, it's and it can be calculated using this equation, which is basically standard deviation of the fluctuating component over your mean wind speed. And we can have three different uh, turbulence intensities in three different directions. If you take a look at this picture on the right hand side, we have measurements for wind speed in, three, uh, in all three directions. The integral length scale is basically um, a, a representative length for the size of the energy containing eddies. And it can be calculated using this equation that you, that you see on the left hand side. The U is the mean uh, longitudinal wind speed at a height. R is the temporal autocorrelation of the fluctuating longitudinal wind velocity as a function of a temporal shift. And we divide that by the variance of the aligned wind velocity component. Another approach that we can use for estimating um, integral length scale is basically to find it by fitting the measured data to a theoretical spectrum like von Karman spectrum. But um, you, in general, integral length scale can be thought of as a representative size for the energy containing eddies in our uh, wind. Okay, the first question that we wanted to answer in a partial turbulence simulation was related to how we should simulate wind inside the wind tunnel such that we can get a good match between my, uh, between my high frequencies, which is this part of the spectrum. In order to satisfy this, we are basically using uh, Two, two equations. The first one is we need to have the, the vertical axis in my spectrum equal between the full spectrum and the one that is done in a partial turbulence simulation. And we also need to, we also need to have uh, the, the horizontal axis equal between them such that we could, we could have a good match between the high frequencies. If we do that and we assume a von Karman distribution for the full spectrum, we can do some simplifications in the math and we can find, find out an equation like this one, which is basically a relationship between my turbulence intensity, turbulence integral length scale, and my model scale between my model and prototype, which is, and the prototype is basically the full scale. In a full turbulence simulation that we have in a small scale testing, the ratio of the length scale in the model to prototype is equal to the size, any size, for example, height of prototype to, to height of your model. Then referring back to this equation, you find out that your in turbulence intensity inside your wind tunnel should be equal to the turbulence intensity at full scale. In a partial turbulence simulation uh, flow, this ratio of the length scale is smaller than the ratio of my model scale. That means that if we refer back to this equation, the turbulence intensity that I should have inside my wind tunnel such that I could get a good match at high frequency should be smaller than what I have at full scale. So if we use this equation, we get a smaller turbulence intensity than full scale, but this, this uh, basically allows us to have a pretty good match between the turbulence at full scale and turbulence in a partial turbulence simulation flow at the right energy level. The next question that we have for performing wind simulation is to find the intensity of the missing low frequency turbulence. Take a look at the schematic of the wind velocity on the left hand side. The wind velocity at each time can be written as a summation of the mean wind speed plus the contribution of the low frequency fluctuations plus the contribution from high frequency fluctuations. What we are basically simulating in a partial simulation uh, for the mean wind speed is the mean that we have at full scale plus the contribution of the low frequency. So when you write the definition of high frequency turbulence intensity, you get an equation like this, 
and your mean wind speed in a partial simulation is basically your mean plus UL, which is the low frequency component. You can write the equation for low frequency turbulence intensity at low frequency, low frequency turbulence intensity using this equation. Then we have an assumption that uh, we bring in to simplify the math, and that is uh, this assumption that I have here, and that says small scale turbulence rapidly adjust to changes caused by large scale turbulence. And this is basically because of the high variations in the velocity that we have close, uh, close to the ground versus height. We are not going to go over all of the math for this, but at, after some simplifications and bringing some assumptions, we can find out an equation like this one here on the bottom that tells me what is the intensity of my missing low frequency turbulence in my partial simulation. And that can basically be calculated using the turbulence intensity that we have at full scale minus the turbulence intensity that we have in our partial simulation, which is calculated using the equation in the previous slide. The third question that we wanted to answer for wind simulation in a partial simulated flow was to find a cutoff frequency between low and high frequencies. I should acknowledge that in reality, there is not a sharp division between high frequencies and low frequencies, but we are basically calculating an approximate value, uh, which is shown in this picture by N sub C, and that helps us in our post-test post um, analysis. We know that if we, again, refer back to the spectrum comparison between full spectrum and partial simulation, we know that the area under the turbulence spectra is equal to the square of the standard deviation. So if we integrate the spectrum in the high frequencies, we get an equation like this one that we have on the top. Then I bring the definition of the turbulence intensity I use, which gives me this equation here. And then I use the von Karman function for my spectrum and I put it inside my and instead of my um, SU, and then doing some math and simplifications, we can find an approximate equ uh, an, an equation that approximately tells me what is the dividing frequency between low and high frequencies. Okay, uh, as I explained before, in partial turbulence simulation, we divide our spectrum into two distinct statistical processes. The first one is um, at high frequencies, which is simulated in wind tunnel. And we went over a couple of relationships that we need to satisfy in order to be able to have a good match at high frequencies between the turbulence spectrum and a partial simulation and the full spectrum. The next part is to compensate for the lack of low frequencies in the post-test analysis. And that is what I am going to go over now. And it is a methodology for calculating the pressure coefficients in such that we include the effect of lack of low frequencies. For this low frequency part, we treat, uh, we treat the wind turbulence in a quasi-steady manner. So we said we divide the turbulence into two distinct statistical processes. For the high frequency, which comes from wind tunnel, we assume a fissure to the type 1 distribution or gumball distribution for the peak pressure uh, coefficients that we get from wind tunnel testing in a partial simulated flow. And then for the low frequency part, we assume a Gaussian distribution because the probability distribution of the wind turbulence in a generic boundary layer is Gaussian. Then we take the joint probability of load from these two processes and we can uh, do some simplifications and we finally get an equation for the probability of exceedance based on expected peak pressure coefficient uh, for each test and that is given by this equation here and we can take this numerically and finally we get um, curves like this which which are basically probability of exceedance or g value based on expected peak pressure coefficient at full scale for each experiment that that we do we can uh, we can find the a and b values which are basically coming from more than this uh, dispersion parameters of the gumball distribution that we assume for peak pressure coefficients in the wind tunnel and then using having the a and b value we can go to each of these curves and select 
what is the expected peak pressure coefficient that I, um, that, that I, that I would have in false k. For the 3D partial turbulence simulation, uh, we, we assume that the peak pressure coefficient can be calculated using this equation. In here, my, my pressure coefficient is now a function of tilt angle and azimuth angle. So these, this is how we define the tilt angle, and this is how we define the azimuth angle, which is in the horizontal direction. Our wind velocity also includes the effect of low frequency turbulence uh, velocities in the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical directions. It is that 3D partial turbulence simulation, it's highly mathematical. I am not going to go over all of the steps that we use to find out the probability of exceedance, but at the end of the day for uh, doing some uh, some assumptions and simplifications, we come up with an equation like this one that you see here, which gives me the probability of exceedance based on uh, for for ba for basically calculating the expected peak pressure coefficient. And these are probability density functions for each of the for each of these functions that we have here. One thing to note that the probability density for my pressure coefficient now also depends on the phi and theta angle, which is my azimuth and uh, pitch angles. And you know, you can see that my A and B values are now a function of phi and theta. In order to get these values from experiments, we need to do the experiments at different azimuth angles and different pitch angles. And uh, I should say that 3D partial turbulence simulation method is experimentally more demanding than just a simple uh, PTS methodology. We perform some large scale uh, experiments in Wallopin in order to validate this methodology. We are going to look at the results of experiments. We, uh, we had full scale data available for two full scale buildings. One of them is called Silso Cube. It is a six meter cube located in UK for which very good data for, from full scale tests are available. And then we also looked at the uh, full scale data from Texas Tech University Research Building, which we call it TTU. And uh, I am going to present the results for these two uh, full scale buildings in the following slides. We we'll look at the results from Silso Cube first. This is a one to five scale of Silso Cube located in uh, Wall of Wind. On the right hand side, you see a comparison between the Wall of Wind partial spectrum and full spectrum at atmospheric boundary layer. You can see that we are, uh, we are matching the high frequency part, but we are uh, losing energy in the low frequency part. Take a look at this table that I have on the bottom. It is it includes some of the characteristics of the test at full scale and wall of wind. One thing that I want to um, mention is a comparison between the turbulence intensity at full scale as compared to the turbulence intensity that we had in wall of wind. You see the one that in the one in wall of wind is much smaller than we have at full scale, and this is basically the way that we can match the turbulence at high frequencies at the right energy level. We are going to, we are looking at some results of pressure coefficients for one tap on, uh, on a Silso cube for different wind directions. Pressure coefficients are normalized forms of wind pressures and we are going to look at the mean pressure coefficients and also peak pressure coefficients in the Silso cube. The chart on the left hand side shows the mean pressure coefficients for tap H24, which is located in the corner of a wall versus different wind directions between full spectrum and wall of wind, full scale and wall of wind. You can see we have a pretty good match for the mean pressure coefficients between full scale and wall of wind. And that basically tells me that I am simulating the high frequency part uh, properly. If we didn't, if we were not simulating the high frequency part properly, we were not, we didn't have such a good match between the mean values at full scale and at wall of wind. On the right hand side, I am comparing the peak pressure coefficients versus wind direction. This line, the dashed line with triangle markers shows what we observe from wall of wind data. That means that if you have a time history of pressures and you go and find what is the maximum pressure that you get from that time history and then normalize it in form of peak pressure to get it in the 
form of peak pressures, this is the line that you get. And you see that it is, it is different from what you expect at full scale, which is shown by this solid line. But after we uh, applied PTS methodology, we were able to get a very good match between the data that we got from wall of wind and what we expect at full scale. Next, we are going to take a look at some of the experiments that we performed for, on TTU models. Uh, we, we performed tests for different scales of the TTU model in order to see the applicability of PTS methodology for different scales and find if there is any limitations. We started with one to 100 scale, which is this, this one that you see on the top left. Then we moved on to one to 50 scale, then one to 20 scale, then we went to one to 10 and one to six. So these are the five different scales that we tested out all of them. And then for the one to six, we also did test for uh, basically uh, 3D partial equivalent simulation methodology validation. And that is uh, in that one, we need to have the building tested at different azimuth and tilt angles. And this is basically why we have this platform and the experiments by which we can basically tilt the buildings at different angles. And uh, we also use the time table in order to test at different azimuth angles. We have in this slide, we have the turbulence power spectrum for all five scales compared to what we expect at full scale. So on the top, I have the, the turbulence power spectra for the scale one to 100, one to 50, and then one to 20. The red lines show what we expect at full scale, and the black lines show what we are simulating in ball of wind. You can see that for the smaller scale, we have a pretty good match at high frequencies between wall of wind and uh, full scale, and also a good match at low frequencies. This is also the case for the 1 to 50 scale. And then as we start to increase our scale to 1 to 20, 1 to 10, and 1 to 6, you are seeing that we are able to simulate the high frequency part properly, but we are missing energy at the low frequency. And we are going to compensate for the lack of these low frequency components in the post-test analysis using PTS methodology. This is uh, a table that has the characteristics for the tests that we perform for TTU. It includes the scale, all the wind speeds that we perform experiment at, the turbulence intensity at, at E point, and also this parameter that is the length scale over uh, the height of my building. We perform tests at different wind speeds in order to study the Reynolds number effect because um, higher, uh, higher wind speed for test means higher Reynolds number. And this is why we did the test at different wind speeds. You can take a look at the turbulence intensity uh, at Eve height comparison for different scales. For the smaller scale, uh, like one to 100 and one to 50, you can see that the turbulence intensity that we have at, the, at Eve height it's uh, closer to what we, it's very close to what we expect at full scale. But at, as we increase this, uh, our scale to one to 10 and one to six, the turbulence intensity that we, uh, that we basically had in our wind simulation is lower than what, we, uh, that, that, than what we have at full scale. And this is uh, to match the, the spectrums at high frequencies. One uh, parameter that I would like to uh, talk a little bit about is the ratio of the length scale over um, an, a building dimension, which in this case is the building height. If you take a look at ASC 49, which is for wind tunnel testing or ASC 710, they require you to have this ratio more than three in order to have a proper turbulence uh, simulation. You can see that for smaller scales, we are satisfying this ratio. But as we increase the scale, we are not satisfying this ratio anymore. So one of the beauties of partial turbulence simulation me method is basically uh, is, is that it basically allows us not to satisfy this requirement and still get a very good full scale equivalent data. We can also take a look at turbulence spectrum in terms of wavelength. Uh, wavelength is de uh, defined as your uh, velocity divided by frequency. And this schematic is a comparison between 
what you have in full scale, which is shown by uh, blue, and what you are, uh, what you would have in a partial, uh, uh, partial spectrum like what we have in wall of fin. And you can see that we are able to simulate up to uh, 10 or, uh, or 11 feet of wavelength in a wall of fin, and we need to treat the rest in a quasi steady manner. The higher the wavelength value you can simulate inside your wind tunnel, you are going to get more accurate results, meaning closer to what you expect at full scale. This, um, this slide shows some of the uh, mean pressure coefficients for TTU buildings. Uh, we, are, we have uh, contour plots of mean pressure coefficients on TTU on the exploded uh, view of TTU buildings. So here is the roof and then these are the four walls and the contour changes by varying wind direction. This all, it is always a good idea to look at your mean pressure coefficients first. And that tells you if you are basically simulating your wind flow properly and you are simulating your high frequency part properly. For example, on the cornering winds, I expect to see the formation of conical vertices. And that is basically, and looking at this, uh, this contour plot that um, helps me find out if I am getting the, the um, formation of conical vortices properly. In this slide, I have some uh, peak pressure coefficients for all wind directions from TTU test for two tabs. So this is the, uh, this is the uh, exploded view of TTU. We are looking at tab 194 and 203, which are located in the corner of roof on TTU building. And this is the way that we are defining the wind direction. So on the left-hand side, we have the mean pressure coefficients uh, predicted by PTS methodology for all five different scales that we have for different wind directions for TAP 194. And for in the right-hand side, we have the same data for TAP 200, uh, 203. The full scale value or values are shown by these hollow uh, red circles. And you can see that we have a better, uh, a better match between the full scale and wind tunnel as we increase the, um, our model scale for both of the tabs. What is really important for us at the end of the day is for looking at uh, the worst case scenarios. And by that, I mean, the worst wind load or the highest wind load that you get from testing at all of these different wind directions. So this chart shows the peak pressure coefficient predicted by PTS methodology for all the five scales that we tested at wall of wind and compa uh, compared to full scale. And this is showing the worst case from all wind directions. You can see that for the, for the worst case that we had, which was the top nine, 194, we are getting a very good data uh, from our one to six scale compared to full scale. In this slide, I would like to go over the corrections that PTS methodology would make versus scaling. So on, uh, on we have five different graphs for five different scales. 1 to 100, 1 to 50, 1 to 20, 1 to 10, and 1 to 6. For tab 194, which is located on the corner of the, of the roof, and we are looking at pressure coefficients versus direction. The solid line shows the, the minimum uh, value from uh, PTS methodology, and the dashed line shows the, what we observe from uh, wall of wind. And you can see that for the smaller scales, the, the amount of correction that PTS methodology does is not much. And this is, uh, this, is, um, this is what we expect because at these smaller scales, we do not have a lack of low frequency. So we don't expect PTS to make a lot of corrections to, them, to our data. But as we go to larger scales, like one to 10 and one to six, you see that the correction that we have in between, from the PTS methodology to the observed wind uh, pressure data are more and more. And this is because we have more lack of low frequency in our larger scale. 
In this slide, I am comparing the results of PTS methodology with only performing an extreme value analysis on the pressure coefficient using various scales. Again, we have we are looking at pressure coefficients. Now it's based on it's uh, the pressure coefficient versus not tap number. We are looking at a number of taps here, and we are looking at data from a cornering wind direction, which is 135 degree angle and we are looking at five different scales. You can see that for the, the, the full scale values are shown by these red solid line. The, the dashed line, the triangles is what we, we get from PTS and the dashed line with cross marks is one we get from extreme value analysis without the, uh, without the correction uh, for the low frequency, for the missing low frequency. You can see for smaller scales, there is, no, there is not much difference between PTS and extreme value analysis. And this is something that uh, we expect, as I explained before, because for smaller scale, we don't have much of lack of low frequency. But when you look at the larger scales, you can see that there is, uh, there is differences between performing only an extreme value analysis to your data or applying PTS methodology. And this is because doing only an extreme value analysis doesn't include the lack of low frequency turbulence in your data, whereas the PTS methodology does, and we get uh, very good uh, agreement between the full scale data and my uh, PTS corrected values. Looking at the Reynolds number effect, I am comparing uh, my, uh, my smallest scale, one to 100, to my largest scale, one to six, for three different uh, Reynolds numbers. So I have the full scale, which is uh, giving me the full, uh, the full uh, scale Reynolds number. Then my largest scale, one to six, gives me this Reynolds number, which I'm showing it with the orange line. And the smallest scale, one to 100, has the lowest Reynolds number. And you can see that for, um, for, for some of the locations which are basically under the conical vortices or critical locations on the roof, Reynolds number definitely has an effect. And you can see that the value that we, uh, that the, 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 the agreement that we got from PTS corrected value uh, performing, uh, which, is a which is also a test at larger scale, meaning larger Reynolds number, we could, we could get a very good agreement between the um, uh, the, the full scale and also our model scale. And finally, um, uh, some, uh, some little results for the 3D PTS uh, methodology. As I said, for 3D PTS methodology, we need to perform the experiments at different azimuth and different tilt angles, which we did for, uh, which we did for both of the TTU and Silso cube. Uh, buildings. I have just this slide that shows the comparison of the 3D PTS methodology with full scale for one row of tabs, which are B1 to B4. In this slide, we are looking at peak pressure coefficients. The dashed line with, uh, with these stars is what we get from uh, is what we get from a wall of wind. It's the observed value. The full scale data is shown by red. And then this dash line, the triangle shows the 3D PTS uh, corrected value. We believe that 3D PTS is best to use for locations where the pressures are highly sensitive to variations of wind direction, for example, those ones that are under the conical vortices on the roof. PTS methodology is now being used for all of the experiments performed in wall of wind that include pressure measurements. We have done an, a lot of tests in wall of wind and applied PTS methodology. Uh, these are some samples of the tests. For example, in this one, we are looking at the effect, uh, effect of um, uh, parapets, different geometry of edge, um, edge corrections to the wind pressures. Uh, this, uh, this experiment is basically looking at pressure coefficients for elevated buildings. Then we uh, studied the effect of heights on pressure coefficients in buildings and applied PTS methodology. Uh, this test is uh, performing pressure measurements on um, roof pavers, and this is an experiment that we performed for that. And we also did experiments uh, on, uh, on the effect on basically looking at wind loading for balcony handrails on 
uh, mid rise and high rise buildings, which you see uh, a case here. In conclusion, uh, I should say that we have developed a methodology called partial permanent simulation, and that is for predicting peak wind loads on small structures and building appurtenances. We have uh, assessed the eff efficacy of this methodology using some large scale models of CISO cube and TTU building. This methodology is developed in Wall of Wind and it is validated in Wall of Wind, but it is not only uh, applicable to Wall of Wind, it can be uh, equally uh, used in any boundary wind tunnel testing. One thing that I want to mention that in order to get full scale equivalent data, you need to do two things. First of all, you need larger scales in order to have larger uh, Reynolds number, and then you need to also uh, uh, correct for the lack of low frequency that you do in your test in order to be able to get full scale equivalent data. Uh, the methodology's advantages in experiments from uh, the measurement accuracy and repeatability of simulations point of view, and it basically allows use of uh, use of considerably larger model scales and higher angles number testing. Uh, these are some of the references uh, that you, if you needed more information about PTS methodology, you can uh, refer to the paper that we published in Journal of Wind Engineering and Industrial Aerodynamics and two dissertation, one by me and one by Dr. Moravage uh, at FYU. I would like to thank NSF NERI funding for funding uh, FIU Wall of Wind NERI Experimental Facility. And I would like to also thank my uh, team members for all their, great, all their great contribution to this work. And I would also thank, uh, would like to thank all of you for attending this uh, webinar and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Asgari, Asgari Munegi. This is a very informative presentation. Uh, at this time, we'll transition to the Q&A session. Um, attendees are reminded uh, that questions should be submitted through the Q&A panel. And we do have some, some great questions for you. Um, the first one is, uh, can PTS uh, be used on components such as aperture, apertures on tall buildings? I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but. Yes, uh, so if I go back, the, the short answer is yes. If I go back to the slide, we are using, uh, uh, PTS methodology is developed for small structures and uh, components and claddings. So if, if it is not only low rise buildings that you could use PTS for, you can use it for um, you can use it for a lot of different smaller structures like pavers, solar panels, balcony guards, or if you have curtain wire features such as fin and tall buildings, you could use it. Some of the assumptions that when it, uh, when it, for taller, uh, for tall buildings and components and claddings, we, uh, we, we have made some little adjustments to PTS methodology to make it suitable for, um, for basically components and cladding on tall buildings. Uh, and we are using it in this project that you are seeing it here. So it is a project that we are looking at the effect of wind loads on balcony handrails on tall buildings. And we are using PTS methodology uh, basically to, to get our peak wind loads on balcony handrails. Okay. Uh, you said that the wall of wind is now doing this as a standard. Um, but how does someone obtain the software to apply this method to prior wind tunnel tests or tests done elsewhere? Uh, I, we have developed a software that does PTS methodology and we have, uh, I, I am not sure if it is available in, to use for, for like uh, everyone, but all the steps and all the, uh, and even just, um, uh, even the, the, the code that we developed for all of different um, sections of PTS methodology is published in our paper and in our presentations. So if you go to our presentation, you can see the line by line coding of the PTS methodology that you can just code yourself and, uh, and do this methodology. I am just not sure if Wall of Wind is basically giving the software, as I'm not sure if they just, if the software is available for everyone, but the line by line coding and all the details are available in the 
references that I uh, that I basically have in the presentation. Okay. Um, and then was there a comparison done between uh, the one one D PTS and three D PTS? Yes, uh, I think oh, I do not have it in this in this presentation, but we did compare PTS and 3D PTS, and uh, the results of that is all of it is included in the in the dissertation in my dissertation and then the and the paper that we published. It is uh, as I explained before in the in the slide for 3D PTS methodology. The, the the difference is for the locations for some critical locations. Uh, for example, if you have just a single tap on the on under a conical vortices on your roof that is very critical, then that is the case that you see a difference between 3D PTS and uh, just the PTS methodology. You can take a look at my presentation. It is all there. There are all kind of comparisons between. Uh, PTS and 3D PTS methodology. We think for uh, simple applications, it's okay to use the PTS methodology. It get it, it gives you very good data. But if you have um, a sensitive case and you are looking at only may maybe a corner of your roof under conical vortices and you want to know what is the exact uh, distribution of pressure coefficients, we recommend performing a 3D PTS analysis. Okay. Uh, if you go back one slide to slide 38, mm -hmm. the Reynolds number for one to six scale is slightly higher than the full scale. Did you achieve that by compensating with higher speed in the wind tunnel than the full scale? In yes. Scale? Yeah, I think that, that that should be the reason for that. We did test for different uh, wind speeds. And the reason for that is we did at 100% uh, wind speed in wind tunnel. Okay, so you uh, you could not have changed the test speed for other scales. You can, speed. yes, definitely you can. Okay, sure. And um, would you give us some comments on what you see as the future directions for PTS? Sure. So one thing that it's uh, already going on in Wall of Wind is. Uh, basically looking at application of, uh, of the PTS methodology for, uh, for components of, of, of tall buildings that I explained. And uh, another thing that we could uh, maybe look at is basically uh, looking at doing a PTS methodology with uh, comp using CFD computational uh, fluid mechanics. This is, uh, this is going to be a very interesting topic. We have not done it yet ourselves, but we think the same methodology of dividing the frequency into two distinct parts, one at high frequencies and one at low frequencies, could be done also in a CFD simulation where we, we can have two different types of simulation, one that represents the large, uh, large scale turbulence part of, the, part of the simulation, and then get the data from that, that simulation and use it as an input for another another CFD simulation, which is on a finer grid uh, and, in, and basically looks at the small scale turbulence. Uh, I think that that would, be, uh, that would be a very interesting topic to basically look at. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. We're at the conclusion of today's Sim Center webinar. On behalf of the attendees, thank you, Dr. Asghari Munegi for this great introduction to turbulence and simulating its effects to assess wind loads on buildings. To the attendees, thank you for your questions. For additional upcoming NERI webinars, please check the Sim Center's website at simcenter.designsafe-ci.org and check your inbox for emails from announce at designsafe-ci that will have links for registration. Uh, you can also sign up for the Sim Center's community newsletter, where we announce our uh, upcoming webinars as well. Thank you very much for attending today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. Have a great weekend.